Hello. Ladies. We're going to let John start here in just a minute because we have to be out of the building at 10. I have a couple of requests. We're going to let John speak till 945. Before you leave, please carry your chair and stack it over there by the wall. That would be a great help. Make sure all your garbage is in the garbage can and we can pull this off, okay? Because <laughs> I don't want to cut John off any quicker than we have to. And he would speak all night if we'd let him, but the building closes at 10. <laughs> so, Mr. John Rose. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of y'all from the bottom of my heart for giving me an opportunity to come out here and share my passion. This is what I do 24-7. I am a one track. I'm on one track. That's all I can think about. Uh, when I discovered this information 20 years ago, I knew I was really onto something powerful. And it reminds me of what uh, something what Edgar Casey said a long time ago. He said that destiny or karma depends on depends upon what the soul has done about what it's become aware of. Once I figured out I could help people with their suffering, it was a no-brainer for me. I knew what I was going to do for the rest of my life. So I get real excited when I get to talk to one person. When I get to talk to this many people, I get real excited. Um, and I'd like to begin with getting a, a feel for who I'm going to talk to today. So could I see a show of hands? How many people are brand new to this? They don't know anything at all about any of what I'm talking about. Okay, there's quite a few of y'all out here, that's good to know. Um, how about uh, juice feasting or juice fasting or even the master cleanser? Have any of y'all ever done any of these type of uh, protocols? Very good, very good. Okay. Now, tell me, what do you want from me? What do you want to hear? Do you need motivation? Do you need to know the, the hows, the, the whys? Uh, I understand what Nietzsche meant when he said, with a strong enough why, we can bear any how. Are he, I'm sorry? Um, I'd like to know what the difference is between 80 or 90% raw and 100% raw. Okay, we'll go over that down the road. All right. Well, I'd like to know how to improve your digestion. Improve the digestion, all right. What else? Very basic smoothie versus juicy. Okay, all right. How many people here are interested in juice feasting? Because that's my specialty. 99% of people I coach, I'm a little selfish. I want to see some, I want to hear some good results. So I know that this is the fastest, the easiest way to see results. In fact, I think it's a lot harder to make dietary changes. Yes, Nancy. Will you address, John, I've had two friends that did a long-term juice feast, and yes. when they went back to eating cooked food, yes. they gained a lot of weight. Yeah, that can happen. So can you guide us on tips and okay. stuff like that? Because I feel like both of them were very healthy eaters, even cooked, but it was just the difference of wrong. Very good point. Uh, a lot of what you're asking uh, from me right now, we'll have a, a question and answer section toward the, the, the last half of this. So we'll address the specifics at that time. But uh, initially, I just wanted to get a, 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 a good feel uh, of how much time I should, I should spend on the benefits. A lot of people don't really understand why we need to do this and really what's at stake. Our dietary choices go way beyond how it affects us. It affects the environment. And, and it's just amazing. Uh, it's just amazing. So, uh, Hannah, you were... Hannah? Were you... Yes, I'm cancer and juice fasting. Cancer and juice fasting. Okay, very good. All right, I guess where I'll begin, I do have... Uh, Something I can hand out if y'all would pass this around. If you already have one of these, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't expecting this many people, so I might not have enough. If you already have one of these, you might want to save it well, and get one toward the end. Uh, the information I'm, I'm passing out, the main part about the juice tasting is available on uh, my uh, uh, Facebook page. My website's still under construction, but the basic rules, that's page two of what we're handing out right now, is on, if you just do a Google search on me, John Rose, and Facebook, you'll find uh, I have this information on there. Now, this is a program I put together over a decade ago. Nine programs I put together to help people get healthy. Uh, we're going to be focusing mainly on the second page. That's where the juice fasting or juice feasting comes into play. We'll go over those rules specifically. Um, 
the first page helps people get what it gives people different options. If you're not ready to do something as aggressive as a juice feast, then we can go ahead and try a transition program. Uh, the transition program is helpful for people who are so toxic that, that when they go on a juice feast, they can't support their organs of elimination well enough, and they have cleansing reactions. If we can't support our organs, we can always slow down the rate at which we're cleansing. So on the first page, you'll notice under the transition program, there are five food groups, and each food group is like a different speed to cleansing. So if we're cleansing too aggressively, we can slow the rate at which we're cleansing, and that way we won't experience all these cleansing reactions. Well, what are cleansing reactions? These are flu-like symptoms that occur when we make better choices in life, and then the body has a chance to cleanse house. Um, when we're not eating the right foods, it just takes too long to go from point A to point B. Things accumulate. In fact, most people probably have 12 to 15 meals backed up in their intestines at any given time. And that drastically changes the ionic pressure in their colon, and we'll talk more about that. Um, to begin with, let's just briefly go over some of the benefits. Um, who can tell me the benefits of juice feasting? Anybody? Weight loss. Weight loss. I got into this 20 years ago because I was writing a book on weight loss. And I only had 5.8% body fat, 9 pounds of fat on me. And when I did my first juice feast, I couldn't believe in 10 days I lost five pounds. I only had nine pounds of fat. How could I have lost five pounds? I'm writing a book on weight loss. The light bulb went off. I realized there's another component of weight that we carry inside of us, and that's causing a lot of problems. Uh, the average man that I coach, in 30 days, he loses 30 pounds. The average woman, 20 pounds. Of course, I'm saying average now. The average person has a few extra pounds to, to, to lose. Um, if you don't have much weight to lose, you'll be surprised. You may still have something inside you that doesn't belong there. Um, people who are exercising all the time and they can't seem to lose those last five or ten pounds, the reason why they can't get rid of it because it isn't fat. There's junk in the trunk. And I'm the perfect example because when I finally woke up after doing this the first two years on six different occasions, I finally said, John, why are you stopping on day 30 when you're still having things coming out of you? The seventh time I said, I'm going the distance. I don't care how long it takes. And it took me 90 days to get everything out of me. I had stuff coming out of me every day for 90 days. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And I had 20 pounds inside of me. 20 pounds. Now, I have to qualify that because I was an athlete. I was eating five, 6,000 calories a day. I had to. I was exercising seven, eight hours a day. So I was abusing my digestive system a lot like someone who weighs five, 600 pounds. But I was burning off the calories. But still, it, 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 it overtaxed my system. Our body is not designed to eat certain foods, and if we eat too much of it, it just takes a toll on our system. So weight loss is a tremendous benefit that we get from uh, going on a long, extended, properly conducted juice feast. Um, but as we lose this type of weight, we also see disease symptoms disappear. Well, what are disease symptoms? Well, that's nature's way of telling us we're making mistakes. Our brains are, our, our brains are wired for this. It's part of our survival mechanism, pleasure and pain. So every one of our illnesses, even a headache, we should think of it as a warning light on the dashboard of our body. We've got warning lights on the dashboard of our car that tells us something's wrong. Well, every illness we have is nature's way of, of giving us feedback. It's our feedback system. And we need to heed this message from nature and realize we must be doing something wrong. We've got to change what we're doing. So a tremendous benefit from going on a long juice feast is most of your illnesses and even ill behaviors disappear. I'm always uh, amazed when I talk, when I coach um, a minister after three or four days, they say, you know, I've noticed I'm not getting as angry with my congregation anymore. And I think to myself, well, what are you getting angry to begin with? Well, there's a reason. We have toxins inside of us and that irritates us. Diseases go through stages. The first symptom we see when we're full of toxins is irritation. No wonder we struggle so much. And we're not as happy. I was just talking to a, a young lady that I had talked to quite a few years ago. And she notices the same thing, that she's happy all the time. And her coworkers are wondering, well, why are you so happy? <laughs> well, if, it's, it's hard to be happy when we're, we're full of toxins. So one of the main things we'll do on a long juice feast is we'll flush out the, the, the waste matter that we accumulated in our pipes. And what that does is it drastically pulls the waste matter from every cell in our body. And I'll go into that in, in a little bit more detail. Um, so, on a personal level, this is amazing. But then, 
when we look at all of the problems we face as, as a society, there's a reason why we don't get along with one another. There's a reason why we go to war. There's a reason why we have all the problems. In fact, every problem we have, I like to think of it as a negative effect. And again, it's part of our feedback system. We need feedback from nature to let us know whether or not our environment is sustaining us or whether or not we're interacting with our environment the right way. Our lifestyle choices, that's what really matters. Is, is what, are, what are we eating? What are we thinking? Are we getting sunshine? Are we getting exercise? Um, I go to Memorial Park at least once a day, sometimes twice a day, and I always tell this to every woman, I'm amazed. I've only found, out of the hundreds of women I've talked to, only one or two know this. Um, how many women know that, that adequate vitamin D levels prevents 77% of cancer in all women? B or D? D. Oh, yeah. A lot of people don't know that. Now, why isn't this on the news every day? Gosh almighty, this is the most powerful knowledge we have. And yet we're not sh spreading this information out like we should. Um, uh, so uh, the Juice Feast, if you've never done one before, I guarantee you it will be the most exciting and the most exhilarating experience of your entire life. I know because I've done this 903 days uh, on 133 different occasions in the last 17 years. I do this once a year just to remind myself it's more fun than eating. I love eating, but I'm telling you, if you've never done this, you don't know what you're missing. And the best thing that the Juice Feast will do is it will give you a new reference that's going to blow the socks off of all these old references that make you think what you're doing is okay. How can we compete against all these old references? We, we've been brought up thinking colds are contagious. Now we've got the swine flu epidemic. This is all poppycock. This isn't how it works. It's the condition of our body that determines whether or not we have war, crime, violence, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, even the swine flu. And it's what we eat that affects the condition of our body more than any other factor. And just about every system and protocol out there that's trying to solve our problems, they're trying to change the condition of our body, but they don't know how to do it the right way. Allopathic medicine, they're barking up the wrong tree. They teach our medical doctors the anatomy. Well, you don't need to study the anatomy for a lifestyle-related problem. And 90% of what doctors are doing are treating symptoms that are lifestyle-related. They have no business doing this. They're extremely qualified for accidents. When you get an accident and you're bleeding to death, you want someone that knows the body and can control the symptoms. Otherwise, the solution for a lifestyle-related problem is to change your lifestyle. Make better choices. And because there's so much conflicting information out there, the Juice Feast is, is what's going to give you that new experience, that new reference that will help you understand that herbs really aren't the answer, homeopathy is not the answer, Ayurvedic medicine is not the answer, traditional Chinese medicine isn't the answer, allopathic medicine isn't the answer either. But it doesn't mean we can't use every one of those things as long as we take responsibility and we change what we're doing. In fact, I'm, all, I'm, in, I'm in total favor of using any protocol out there that can help the body return back to normal. Because when, we're, when we make these changes and, uh, and we see the changes in the condition of our body, we can't change the condition of our body overnight if we do it the right way. Now, allopathic medicine can give you a drug, and most drugs fall in the class of blockers and inhibitors, so they interfere with the communication process. The symptom goes away immediately. But, it's, but it's, it's like taking your car to a crooked auto mechanic and they cut the wires to the sending unit. That's what drugs are doing. They're not letting the body communicate so that the symptom manifests. That's not a solution. It appears to be, but it's not the solution. We need to change the condition of our body and we have to accept the fact that we can't do it overnight. If it took us 50 years of accumulating negative effects and we have a condition of our body that's screaming at us with all these symptoms, we can't expect those symptoms to disappear the very first day we start making better choices. So in the process of making better choices, we can use some of these other protocols, whether it's an herb or acupuncture or whatever. But we need to take responsibility and realize that none of our systems on this planet can help us. And this is probably the biggest fallacy in humans right now. We keep, we keep expecting the government to solve our economic crises our doctors to find the cure for medicine. And what, I've, what, and what I've realized is that none of our systems can solve our problems for one simple reason. Anyone have any idea why? 
It's because every system out there, just about, is made up of us. And almost every one of us are sick. So how can we expect a sick system with sick individuals to help sick people? It, 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 it goes back to us. We have to take responsibility. There's no one out there that can eat for you and think for you and exercise and get the sunshine and do all the things you need to do but you. And you have to realize that. And if we all took responsibility and did the right thing, then everyone else who's profiting off our suffering will just disappear because we won't be going to them anymore. Now, I, I, I realize how overwhelming a lot of what I'm going to be saying today is for a lot of people. But I want everyone to keep in mind that everything I'm saying tonight is something that every one of y'all can prove to yourself very easily. When you go on a juice feast, after about four or five days, the light bulb goes off because you're still having things come out of you. You shouldn't have that happen if all you're doing is drinking juices. So one of the best things every one of y'all can do is to give this a try. If you go to one of my students' website, juicefeasting.com, the basics is on there for free. We're not, we don't want to make any money off this. We want to make a difference in life. And there's only one way we can solve our problems collectively, and that is for us individually to do the right thing and then share the message. This is the hero's journey. The first step on the hero's journey is do you have the spiritual ears to hear this message? Well, here you are. Second step, do you accept the mission? And if you do, then you want to go out and gather allies, find people of like minds, attend these raw food potluck meetings. And then, most importantly, you got to share this information. And it's disheartening, trust me. I tell this message to everybody I see, no exception. I always try to figure out some way to bring up the subject. And it's disappointing. It's not well received like it should be. But it doesn't slow me down in the least. And I hope it doesn't for you guys either. So, uh, if, if, if you get into the juice feast, what you're going to notice right off the bat is that you keep having eliminations. And that should pretty much make you put two and two together. Yes? Well, that's very important. I'm going to talk about that down the road when we go over that second page. We want to make sure we always have a bowel movement when we're doing a juice feast. You never want to go one day without a movement because we can reabsorb these toxins. And there's several ways to do that. And it's not my job to tell you how to do it. It's to give you the options to figure out which one sounds good for you to do. I sure did. I, I, I have doc and it never occurred to me. Yeah, I, it never occurred to me, but I spent 1,500 hours perfecting a really complicated mathematical procedure to monitor my caloric activity. And with it, I can prove how to lose fat. I started writing a book on weight loss 20 years ago. I was spending two to four hours every day going through the calculations and matching the seven, eight hours of exercise to the five and 6,000 calories I ate. And, I, and, I, and when I did that, I not only figured out how much I needed to eat, but then I realized why most people can't lose fat. They got to protect their lean body mass. And then when I did the first juice feast on day 10, after I lost five pounds, then I, I realized, oh my God, where did I lose those five pounds? Am I losing my muscle? But I knew it wasn't. I was having bowel movements every day. And it never occurred to me to document that. Who would ever think of it? Well, on day 10, I started documenting. So out of the 903 days I've done this, 893 days, I can tell you exactly what came out, when it came out, how much it weighed. I'm a scientist. That's what scientists do. We document. I'm a food research scientist. I've been studying this for, for 22 years. And, and I have, to this day, I still document everything I do. After I did my long 90-day juice feast in 94, I worked really hard to clean out my system, and I wanted to make sure I didn't plug it, back, I plug it back up again. So from that day on, I started weighing everything that came out of me, whether I was on the juice feast or not. And why? Because I want to know if I eat something, how long is it going to take? Is it going to plug me up? Am I going to get in the same boat I was in before? And the good news for me is my bowel movements don't stink at all. <laughs> and actually, some of them actually have a sweet smell to them. <laughs> Hard to believe, isn't it? Uh, so yes, uh, I've gone through great, great measures to figure things out. No one's ever done this before. I wish someone else had done this so I wouldn't have had to have done it. 
Um, and then I continually experiment and try different things, saying, well, let's see what happens if I eat a little different and I eat this at this time instead. I go, oh, look what happened. What usually comes out at 8 o'clock, it didn't come out till 2 o'clock. So I, again, have gone through a lot of, uh, I, 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 I've really worked hard to figure out how all this works. Um, uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and if, if none of y'all have any uh, other interest in, as far as benefits go, let's go ahead and talk about the, the basic rules to juice feasting. Uh, the number one rule that I have on my list, I'm not even convinced anymore it needs to be on there, but I haven't taken it off yet, and that's not to combine the fruits and vegetables. Uh, when I first got into this a long time ago, several decades ago, that's what I read. They said, you don't mix the fruits and the vegetables, keep them separate. But I'm not convinced that's true anymore. Too many people do it and they don't seem to have any problems. So if you don't have any problems combining orange juice with kale, go ahead and do it. If you do, then don't do it. Just, in fact, that's the number one thing everyone needs to do. Pay attention to what works for you. If it doesn't work, don't do it. And always be flexible because what may have worked in the beginning may not work down the road. A lot of people I coach have blood sugar issues. They can't handle fruit in the beginning, but after about a week, sometimes three or four days, they can handle carrot juice. They can even handle apple juice. So Who we never know that. Yes? Yeah, there's this uh, uh, person that says, like, uh, greens uh, should not be cataloged as vegetables. You know, like you have fruit and vegetables, right? But well, there's something else. And she calls it greens. And the greens, you can mix perfectly well with uh, fruit because they're not vegetables. Exactly. Your leafy greens, even when you're eating, you can add lettuce and celery with your fruit meals. When I'm coaching people who are hypoglycemic um, and they can't handle fruit by themselves, if they just add some celery or some lettuce with it, it slows the absorption down. So, good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, the next two uh, rules I have down here has to do with uh, straining our juice and chewing our juice. Now we don't necessarily have to strain our juice all the time. In fact, for some people if they have blood sugar issues, it may be best for them not to strain their juice. But I like my students to be convinced that what I'm saying is true. And I don't like for them to say, well, of course I'm having stuff coming out of me, but um, it's the fiber coming out. Well, if you strain all the fiber out and you're still having something come out of you, then you know for sure that it, it's stuff that needed to come out of you. We also want to chew our juices, meaning that we slosh them around our mouth before we swallow. At least the very first drink we make. That way the stomach knows what's coming on or coming down there. Normally when we're eating and we're chewing, that signals the colon what you're, eat, what, you're, what you're eating. So slosh your juices in your mouth. What's that old rule? You drink your solids and chew your juices. So when you're eating solid food, you make sure you chew it until it's liquid. Our teeth doesn't have any stomach, so we want to make sure and make it as liquid as possible. But then when you're drinking liquids, even if it's a smoothie, a lot of people drink smoothies and they don't leave it in their mouth. You've got to chew it. You've got to add saliva to it. Yes? Um, would it be something, uh, a lot of people are starting to, uh, to make juicing easier. They'll uh, blend out the stuff in the blender and then use a not much milk bag to, uh, how, about, how would that work? That's a definite option. Um, I just watched a uh, video on YouTube yesterday. I don't know if any of y'all seen this or not. Matt and Angela put out a video on their new juicer that they're real excited about. The Harum. Have y'all heard about the Harum juicer? It's a, it's a slow speed. It, it uses an, an auger approach, uh, but then it also has a second stage which the other auger juicers don't have. It presses the juice. It's pretty pricey. It's over $300. And you're really paying for the technology because you're only getting a 150 watt motor. That's not very powerful. And I've seen how the auger type juicers struggle with things like carrots. And they even mentioned that in their little video. They're saying, when we put a carrot in there, it jams it up. We just put it in reverse, just like the Green Star has a reverse on there. And that usually makes it work okay. But I saw the size carrots she was putting in there. And they weren't much bigger than my finger. And they were already jamming up that juicer. So that may be an option for you all. Um, Victoria Bedenko was here recently, I understand, I missed her. What was she saying about the research she had done about the vitamins? Because there's a lot of controversy on whether or not the high speed is destroying the life force of the food. Did, what, did, did she address that issue? She did. She did? She's just talking about the fact that uh, when you blend your food, then it's, uh, when you blend, blend it, then it's not going to oxidize as if you uh, juice it. 
because the fibers remain in it. With fiber remaining, it doesn't oxidize. When you just juice, you better drink it really quick. But she didn't say anything about uh, the high speed. I see. Okay. Well, that was Dr. Max Gerson's concern. If you all know who Max Gerson was, he was a famous cancer um, doctor that was healing people using raw food. He had his patients drink 13 8-ounce 13 8 glasses of juice every day, along with three raw vegan meals, mostly raw. He did allow some people some cooked food because they had to stay on this protocol for several years, so they would give him a treat and have a baked potato. But what he found is that the people who used centrifugal machines weren't healing. And he believed it was the high speed that was destroying the life force in the juice. Just the, the speed of it was destroying the juice. So whether or not that happens with the Vitamix, I'm a little questionable about that. So if I had cancer, I'm not sure if I'd want to use a Vitamix. For the rest of us, I'm sure that is a good option. What so, would you use? What you use? I have a Green Star. Green Star. That's the one I use mainly. I also have an old champion that, um, uh, well, actually it's my second champion, and I use that occasionally, but I prefer the, the Green Star. I'm sorry? Very good. Is it, is, is it a slow speed? Very good, very good. And, and that's what this uh, Haram is. It's only, it only spins like 85 RPM. Why, why do you prefer the Green Star and the Champion? I get about um, almost double the yield. If I'm juicing greens in the Champion, I get about a 50% yield. If I run it through the Green Star, I get about a 90% yield. Is there a big time difference? Yeah. Although the, the Champion always struggles with greens. The leafy greens, it's not a good machine for the leafy greens. It does fruit well, well. Um, and I've coached a lot of people, thousands of people, and when I'm coaching women that use that green star, they really struggle. It takes a little bit of elbow grease to pound that stuff in there. Uh, I'm pretty strong, so I have no problem getting in there and pushing it down. What, when I talk to women, they say, oh, it took me an hour and an hour and a half to do this. I can get it done in 20 minutes or a half hour. I don't, I don't, and I guess it's just because I'm just a hard worker and I got a little more muscle, perhaps. Um, but that's a definite concern for a lot of us. If this is too inconvenient to do, we're not going to do it. We've got to make this work, whatever. Yes? On the green star, I found that if you take a vegetable that has the uh, stem part, it and pulls it right in, doesn't it? I love it, in. yeah. I'll go to the, when I'm doing spinach, I'll go to the trouble to take them off individually and just put it in one stem at a time and it grabs it and pulls it right in. Yeah, because yeah. the wheatgrass, everything, just we, like yeah. that, you just use that part first yes. instead of the leaf. It's a lot faster instead of trying to fo work. force it, yes. <laughs> Her comment was that when you use a green star, if you feed your produce in one item at a time or it, the blades are spinning uh, like this, it'll grab the, the produce and pull it down for you so you don't have to shove it down. The stem. The stem, the stem, the stem the exactly. You, you put the stem in first. Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, we strain our juices, we chew our juices, and we drink them immediately to avoid the oxidation process. We see what happens when we cut an apple open, it, it, it turns brown before our eyes. So the same, th same thing happens to our juices. Now we can make a bunch of juices up ahead of time and put them in con individual containers. You can't put it in one big gallon jug because as you pour it out, now you've got air in there. So if you have a bunch of either pint jars or quart jars or whatever, you can make a whole bunch of juice at one time. And then when you fill up your jars, fill them up to the very, very top so that when you put the lid on, you'll have a little bit of a spillage and you'll get all the air out. I've even had some, some of my students actually buy the devices that will suck all the air out. I'm not sure you have to go to that much trouble. Um, but we have to avoid the air, the light, and the heat. Those are the three things that are going to degrade the juice. So keep it cold, keep it uh, iced down, and in an airtight container. How long would it be good like that in a jar with no air? The, they claim it should last about two days. You, usually you can tell when the juice is going bad because it starts to separate. That's without refrigeration or refrigeration? With ref, even with refrigeration. You, you, you do a champion juice, if you do watermelon in a champion in no time at all, you can see the separation doesn't happen that way with the green stuff. So the, the speed at which that blade is spinning does make a difference. So ideally we drank immediately to avoid the oxidation process. Um, in the past I used to always make my juices as I go along because I office out of my home and it's convenient for me to just go in there and take a break. 
the last several years I've done this, I went on and made it all up at once, and it really is a lot easier to, to spend all that time at one time and have it ready. What I do is I juice twice a day normally. Um, I drink half my juice fruit and half vegetable juice. So uh, I'll, drink, I'll do all my fruit juice at one time. And I'm very fond of watermelon. Of all the fruits, I believe watermelon is one of the best fruits to juice for many reasons. It's, um, it's convenient, it's easy, it's fast, it tastes good. And it's the highest food of all foods in glutathione. And that's an antioxidant that our liver needs to complete a two-phase process to neutralize and eliminate toxins in our body. So because we live in such a toxic world, it only makes sense that we give our body all the things it needs to help deal with the condition that we're in. Are you doing the body You bet. Uh, look, most of the nutrition is always going to be in the out, outer part of our produce. If you buy cabbage, I always see people buying cabbage, they yank the outer layers off and throw it away. That's the most nutritious part. When you're buying beets, the beet tops are more nutritious than the beets themselves. So when you're doing watermelon, cantaloupe, by all means, just clean it well and run the rind through there also. Do you have to use the fruit organic? Ideally. As Dr. Gerson says, you, don't, you can't heal a sick person with sick food. And when food is grown on conventional, with in conventional methods with artificial fertilizer, it creates a sodium-potassium imbalance. Now, Dr. Gerson said that all chronic disease begins with a loss of potassium on a, uh, on a subatomic level. Uh, so, uh, uh, inter intracellular level, I'm sorry. Um, so, using NPK, putting three minerals on the soil is not giving us the minerals we need. Uh, vegetables, they got to be organic because the topsoil is that important to the, the quality of the produce. I'm not as concerned with fruit as much because the fruit trees have roots that go down real deep. As high as the tree is, the roots are going down that deep. So the condition of the soil is not quite the same factor as it is in vegetables, but we still have the contamination issues with the pesticides. Um, and some produce like apples, for example, we sure don't want apples that are conventional. Watermelon, I have a feeling that there's not too many bugs that are on the outside. I don't think I've ever seen a, a bug drill into a watermelon. So when they spray these, are they spraying the melons or are they just spraying the leaves? I don't know. I, my guess is they're only spraying the leaves so they don't get eaten. Um, so uh, ideally everything should be organic, but that can be very cost, uh, costly. And we, again, we got to be practical. If you're on a budget, you, you don't have much money. You got to do what you got to do. Organic veggies cost an awful lot of money. If you did a, 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 if you did a, a juice feast doing green vegetables every day, and that's all you did, you're going to be spending some money doing this. Have you calculated the cost of a juice on a day to day? Yeah, it varies. It can be $10, $15, it can be even more if you're doing a lot of vegetables. And it depends on the machine you got. If you got a machine that's only getting 50% yield, you're going you're gonna to spend a lot of money. Yes? If one is already invested in a Vitamix, <laughs> uh, the ones now have low speed, would that make a difference? Possibly. Okay. But I'm not going <coughs> to say something I don't know. It's still pretty fast. Okay. Um, I wish I had a good answer for you on that one. <laughs> I wish I did. <coughs> yes? The, the Green Star has some kind of uh, magnetic ma magnets in the... Uh, it does have magnets. The, the Green Star does have mag magnets, so it restructures the juice, which should also make it last longer too. Another good. Well, um, uh, when you study structured water, magnets is one way people use. Uh, or, you know, I believe the I believe the wellness filter that the Japanese put out, one of the best filtration systems on the market. Uh, it, it goes through a, a lengthy filtration process, but it also uses magnets also to restructure the water. And in Japan, they're seeing such good results with this that they're, they're making all the, um, the spas have this filtration system in there because they're seeing people heal themselves of cancer and diabetes and all types of illnesses because a lot of the illnesses are uh, related to being dehydrated. And when we do a juice feast, we're addressing that issue of dehydration. We're addressing the issue of toxicity as well as deficiency and even acidity. Now, when we have cancer, we know that all cancer patients are extremely acidic. And we know that alkaline tissue holds 20 times as much oxygen as does acidic tissue. 
And a lack of oxygen is what leads to cancer. So when you got cancer, you want to alkalize your body. You want to pump as much green vegetables in you as you can to change the pH in your body. So we drink, we drink a lot. Now that's the next point we want to go over, um, uh, is how much do we drink? Uh, a good rule of thumb is a gallon a day, but it, it depends on what you drink. Uh, the average woman, a good safe bet would be about 1,200 calories a day. Average man, maybe 1,500, as high as 1,800 calories. So it really depends on what you juice. Uh, a lot of, uh, a common mistake a lot of people make is they're afraid of the sugar in carrots, and I don't think they're that bad personally. I mean, gosh, a Gerson Clinic was using it to heal people with cancer. Uh, the uh, Hallelujah Acres, they're using carrot juice. They even did a study with carrot juice, and they found that when people drank 14 ounces of carrot juice, it only brings their blood sugar up to 116, which isn't that bad. And then that's pure carrot juice, so if you mix it with vegetables and then maybe add some fat with it, like a tablespoon or so of some sort of uh, essential fatty acid, flax oil or hemp oil or something like that, you bring it down even more. But the problem with not using carrots when you use it as a base, when you use go to cucumber and celery, you can come up five, six, seven, eight hundred calories short. If you make a gallon of vegetable juice using carrots and a, a gallon of vegetable juice using cucumber and celery, cucumber and celery are about the lowest of everything in calories. And you're going to be at least 600 calories short per gallon. So you can't just say, i got to drink a gallon, that's it. It really does pay to, 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 to punch in and go ahead and do the calculations for a couple days. When I first started coaching people, I, I calculated everything they did for years. For, for over almost 10 years, I, I had them keep detailed records, and I went through and I did all the math, and, 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 and I saw what they were getting. And that's how I came up with this basic guideline that if you drink a gallon a day, there's a good chance you're going to get everything you need. But if you're more active, you need more. I'm still pretty active, so when I do this, I gotta drink two gallons a day almost. And no one should be afraid of drinking too much, but we need to be afraid of drinking too little. If you don't drink enough, you risk the chance of losing lean body mass. This is why I got into this 30 years ago. I figured out mathematically how to prevent that from happening. And all we have to do is make sure we drink a lot. Now, if you're, um, if you're above average, obviously you need more. If you're smaller than average, then you won't need as much. And I found that the more juice I put through my system, the more weight I would, get, I would lose. Because what we're losing does not have a caloric value. That's why you can lose 30 pounds in 30 days and it's still safe weight loss. Because what you're losing is maybe 20 to 24 pounds of waste matter. That's safe weight loss. What's not safe is having that stuff in us. And why is that detrimental? Well, let me digress for just a second. One of the main jobs our colon has is to be a depository for all the waste matter in our body. And everything in our body works by way of ion, ionic pressure. You know, about 70% 70, 70 of our body is water, approximately, or it should be. And water uses the osmotic flow or ionic pressure. Uh, for you guys being in Houston, we know how, you know how Hurricane Ike came down in, into Houston? Ionic pressure, high pressure, low pressure. So one of the jobs our colon has is to be a depository for all the waste matter in our body. And we've got somewhere between 70 to 100 trillion cells, and every cell is like its own entity. Food needs to come in, waste matter needs to go out. But if our colon is plugged up, the cell membrane senses the rest of the body's toxic, and it knows that it's inside a body. And it knows that if the body dies, it dies too. So it will sacrifice itself if it has to. It will hold on to its own waste matter. And this is the leading cause of diabetes right here. Simple solution for diabetes, flush out that waste matter in your colon, change the ionic pressure in your colon, and every cell in your body is going to start emptying out its waste matter. And then the sugar can go into cells. Same, same principle works for arthritis. I've coached lots of people, and they had to go 100 days before they saw their pain go away. And, and they may have had their colon cleansed by day 30. But just because you've gotten everything out doesn't mean you don't want to leave your colon empty. Even though when we're eating the right foods, it should come out of us really quickly, it still changes the pressure in here. And what we want to do is we want to drastically change the ionic pressure in our colon so it sucks stuff from everywhere in our body. So if you've got uric acid in your joints, which is what causes most, a lot of arthritis, you change the pressure here, it sucks the waste matter from your joints. It sucks it from everywhere. 
When I did my 90-day juice feast, the blue eyes I had as a child that turned hazel as an adult turned back to blue. How did that happen? My colon sucked the stuff out of it. So most people's colons are like a balloon. The pressure's greater inside than it is supposed to be. And we want to convert our colon from a balloon into a black hole. So it sucks stuff into it. It's like turning your vacuum cleaner on high-speed cleansing. Now, have you ever tried vacuuming a rug and your vacuum cleaner bag is full? Doesn't work, does it? Well, that's what our colon is like when there's too much junk in the trunk. So, the juice feast does things. The juice feast does things that nothing else can do. It really does. If you adopt a raw vegan diet, it may take you three years to get to where you want to be. Juice feast, you can do it about three months. So, if you're suffering, why suffer? Doesn't even make any sense to me. And also, it's the easiest way for me, I think, for people not to eat the wrong food. As long as you're eating, it's not easy to say, okay, I'm supposed to eat this, but you know, I'm eating, I might as well eat this. But when you, say, when you commit yourself to saying, I'm not going to eat anything, I'm just going to drink, drink my food, that's the easiest way not to eat the wrong food. It really is. It may not sound like it, because a lot of us have never done it before, but once you get past the first few days, it gets a lot easier. Yes? I have a couple of questions. On the uh, essential fatty acids here, you've got PPO. Can you say what that I'm is? I'm almost at that. I'm, 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 I'm on number six, and you got me <laughs> going to number seven. My other one is how much does you put in each uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. I like to be very methodical in what I do. That way, I make sure I do it right. But good question. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Uh, so we drank a lot. Number six, you got to make sure you don't stand up too quickly. You might get lightheaded or dizzy. Well, why is that? Because most of the blood is in here cleaning the house. For the same reason, we feel cold on the outside, not as much blood on the outside. Our body temperature is the same, but we, don't, we, we, we feel cold because of that. Number seven, supplements. <laughs> the main supplement you need to do is some sort of essential fatty acid. Even though your leafy greens are about 12% fat, and if you're drinking a gallon of vegetable juice, you're probably getting all the fat you need. But just to make sure, let's do at least one tablespoon of some form of essential fatty acid. For men, flax oil will work for us. Women, there's not enough omega-6 in flax for women. So they need to add something like borage oil to it, EPO, evening primrose oil, black carrot oil. A better, a, 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 an even simpler solution would just go straight to hemp oil. Hemp oil has the perfect omega-3, omega-6 ratio and we need at least a tablespoon a day. Many people have gallbladder attacks when they go on a low calorie diet because they're not consuming enough fat. If we don't get at least about, about 10 grams or so of fat a day, we might have a, a gallbladder attack. So this is one way to avoid having a gallbladder attack is to make sure we put that tablespoon of oil into our juices. If you're having blood sugar issues, instead of doing one tablespoon a day, you might do three. Put a teaspoon in every one of your drinks. And if you're going to drink a gallon a day, I prefer to drink smaller quantities more frequently, like a pint every hour and a half, as opposed to a quart every three hours. Dr. Gerson believed that if we drank too much at one time, we might not absorb it. It might go through the system so fast, we, we might not assimilate it. That's why he had his patients only drinking uh, eight ounces every hour. So uh, the, the essential fatty acids is very, very important to take. That's, the, that's really the main supplement we need to worry about at this point. There are lots of other supplements that can help us. There are a lot of superfoods on the market, and they've come a long ways over the years. They've really refined the process, and they're making good quality superfoods. Do we need them? Well, if you're, juicing a pound of, if you're drinking a pound of leafy green juice a day, I think it's a waste of money to add any superfoods in you, unless you got cancer and your pH is so low, you want to pump as much stuff in you to raise those alkaline minerals in your body. Um, so what kind of superfoods? Uh, vi vitamineral green, perfect food. Uh, vitamineral green is one of my favorites. Where do you get it? Whole Foods? It, Whole Foods does not have it, last I checked. Good deal. That's great. Thanks, Alex. All from the farm. Oh, vitamin O'Brien. It's on his list. Oh, okay. It's on his list.
Are you familiar with Green Vibrance? I don't think so. It's practically all organic or wild greens, and they have it at the vitamin shop. <coughs> David told me this a while back out of the Tree of Life out in Arizona. They're just going out into the woods and cutting a bunch of grass, wild grass. Yeah. Coming home, put it in your dehydrator, make your own. What is that known as dehydrated greens? De dehydrate, your own, dehydrate your own greens. If you can find some purslane or lamb's quarter, that's the way to go. Ann Whitmore, who was famous of healing people, she had a, an energy soup recipe. And she, um, uh, she used baby sprouts in the, in the beginning, but toward the end of her career, she went away from those and she went to the wild edible weeds like purslane and lamb's quarter. Mm -hmm. Where do you get lamb's quarter? I've never seen any in the store. Go get some seeds and plant them in your yard. They're, they, they supposedly take off pretty well. You can order them <laughs> from Seeds of Change and it's a weed, so it grows easy. <laughs> seeds of Change? Okay. Um, other supplements. There are many supplements that could be beneficial if you have certain conditions. You might have um, cancer and you might benefit by taking natural cellular defense. NCD. Or you might benefit by taking Vitalzyme. It's a protolytic enzyme. Dr. Max Gerson was using a proteolytic enzyme in his protocol, but Vitalzyme is a very, very good uh, digestive enzyme, not a digestive enzyme, a proteolytic enzyme that gobbles up tumors and scar tissue. They're seeing uh, great results over in Europe. They've been using this over in Europe for over 30 years. And they've done some really interesting studies with athletes who get injured. And they find they recover much faster by taking these Vitalzymes because when we have an accident or even an operation, there's scar tissue. And this will help gobble up the scar tissue. So if I had cancer, I would seriously consider taking natural cellular defense and vital zyme, a few other things. Vital, Z-Y-M-E. Or no E, just Z-Y-M. Vital, Z-Y-M. Vital zyme. I don't sell any products for a reason. I'm an educator. I feel like if I sold these, you might not believe me. Oh, I got some vital zyme over here, yes. Buy them. That's, I refuse to do that. Dr. Nixon, why are you saying to dehydrate the wild edibles? To make a powder out of it, and then you can add the powder into your juices. But if you're going to juice, why not just throw them right into the juice? Because you can get a, a larger concentration. And, and if you're drinking a gallon of juice, good question, why bother? But if you have cancer and you're extremely acidic and you want to pump more minerals in your body, this would be one way to do it. Just one way to do it. The thing about grass is grass is the only plant that can pull all 92 minerals out of the soil. No other plant can do that. That's why Ann Whitmore went to the wheatgrass. But I'm, I'm, I, I agree with you. I'm not real big on supplements. I'm really not. In fact, when I have my students do, uh, do a juice feast, I prefer them to do as few supplements as possible. That way they learn a lesson from this. They realize that, oh my gosh, I quit doing certain things and my problems went away. And it wasn't because I put some white powder and some lemon juice in the morning. But that's what my people might think. So I, I, it's sort of a sensitive issue with me. I don't, I'm not real fond of, of supplements. But there is a time and a place for them. In the beginning, we want to, we're going to be suffering because of our, the condition of our body. So we've got to help the body as, as much as we can. And, and, and in the beginning, we can use some superfoods along those lines. John, if someone's not able to make all the juice, is wheatgrass juice helpful? And if you have like um, a chaser of pomegranate juice that's not live, does that interfere with the absorption of the wheatgrass juice? Dr. Floor was Ann Whitmore's assistant for the last 22 years of her life. And she says when you do wheatgrass, do it all by itself and leave it in your mouth for two minutes to let it absorb sublingually. And then the body temperature warms up the starches, converts it to sugar, and you won't have the digestive problems that some people have. Um, the reason why, no, rule number one, don't combine fruits and vegetables. A long time ago I read, 
and I've never seen anything to confirm this, that it takes about five minutes for fruit to empty your stomach and about 10 or, 15, or about 15 for vegetables. If that's really true, then you wouldn't want to do it a, a, a shaker right away. But if you leave it in your mouth, it's going to be absorbed sublingually and it shouldn't absorb, it shouldn't affect the assimilation of it. But leaving that in your mouth, <laughs> I uh, that phrase, taking your medicine, boy, that really applies here, doesn't it? She says that grasses, well, according to Victoria, if it's a green leaf, it's okay to mix it with fruit. But like cucumber is not a leaf and therefore it's not okay. So grass, she said if you can wrap it around your finger, then it's a leaf and you can mix it with fruit. But I was wondering, if the grass is live and the pomegranate is dead, would that dead. be a problem? I don't think so. I really don't. I mean, the main reason why the juice feast works so well is because it gives our body what it really wants, a vacation, a solid food vacation. And then it changes the ionic pressure in the cold. Most of our problems are not due to deficiency. Most of them are due to toxicity. Okay. Most of them. I saw a hand over here a while back, and I didn't get to you earlier. I'm sorry. On your, um, on your sheet on supplements, you, you have the chocolate pH on there. And I have a rather large Boston that I'm going to work on dissolving so we have a little bit of time. Um, what is your protocol during a juice piece? For you bet. So glad you, you brought that up. Yes, uh, I have the chocolate pieter listed on there. Um, I like to have my students do the chocolate pieter at the onset of the juice feast. And you can go to Whole Foods, they got a product called Stonebreaker, and just follow the instructions on that container. It'll, it'll tell you to take a drop of full three times a day. Um, and I would go ahead and do that for at least a month. Um, I just found a product, and I, it, the name of it escapes me right now. I'll probably think of it momentarily. But there's another product that has chocolate piedra in it, and it's delivered by way of a suppository. To me, that makes a lot of sense. This is supposed to get right straight to it in a much more efficient manner. Is there any concern about when taking that about, because what I want to do is dissolve it right. without having it come out. I don't want to get the dissolved by it to go crazy and want to expel it yet. Because um, that's not part of the action. Yeah. 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 It's really going to work on it. Yeah, it just dissolves it. Yeah, yeah it just dissolves it. So basically, when we're doing a juice feast, we, we want to support all of our organs of elimination, which I'm getting to here just, just in a few minutes. But we also have to understand that we have to be aware of any temporary impairment we have. I talked about this just a little while ago. Um, uh, and if we have gallstones, if our liver is compromised, we might not be making certain level two nutrients. You might need additional supplements. You might not even be making any cholesterol. Cholesterol is a precursor to every hormone we got. If you're not making cholesterol, you're in trouble. A lot of health problems might be traced back to that. Uh, if your liver is compromised, you might not be making certain level two nutrients like taurine, which is a sulfur amino acid our liver needs to make the glutathione. So it's really, it, in 90% of the cases, it doesn't matter. Most of us can do this and not worry about a thing. But the rest of us, if we're not seeing the results we're looking for, it's because we've got some sort of permanent damage or temporary impairment that we still have to address. <coughs> so in addition to supporting the organs of elimination, we want to support all of our organs that are, that are temporarily impaired. Yes? I had never heard of that. Chandra, what is that? It's an Amazonian herb. It translates to break stone. And it breaks stones in your kidneys and in your gallbladder. It, it, you can buy it, if you go to Whole Foods, you'll get it in a tincture form, but you can buy it in a pill form, you can buy it in a, 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 a tea form if you want to make a tea out of it instead. So do you put it in your juices? Is that what No, they tell you to put it in water, and that's real important because that's the delivery system to make sure it goes to where it needs to go. Uh, they don't specify, and I'm not sure if it matters. That's a good question. I, yeah, I, so that's something you're recommending because it's on your sheet. That's what I was thinking. It's an option that you can, it, it's, I believe, well, you have to support all your organs of elimination. The liver is a big organ of elimination. Whether or not you need to do anything extra or not is questionable. When I'm coaching people, most people don't have issues. And they don't have to do anything special. 
But if you're doing everything right, if you're drinking plenty of juice, and you're making sure your bowels are moving, and you're supporting all the other organs of elimination except for the liver, and then you have what's called a cleansing reaction, which I'm getting to in just a moment, that tells me your liver can't handle this toxic load. Because as soon as you start drinking juices, and as soon as you start flushing out this waste matter, and the ionic pressure changes, every cell starts emptying out its waste matter. And we may have as many as 100 days worth of toxins coming out of our body in one day. And sometimes the liver can't handle that toxic load. This was the secret, this was the trick, I should say, to Dr. Uh, Gerson's protocol. He was specializing with people with cancer. And he says, you don't get cancer unless your liver is damaged. And he found that if he didn't do something to help support the liver when they were drinking all these juices, that they would have these severe cleansing reactions. So he was very adamant about this. He says, don't drink juices without the coffee enemas. Don't do the coffee enemas without the juices. For every coffee enema you do to support the liver, you got to drink 24 ounces of vegetable juice. So he was using coffee enemas in his protocol. They still do. And that's what I used to use in the past, but I had, didn't have to tell that many people about it. Not that many people had any problems. But if you are doing everything right, then you start having these cleansing reactions, which are the flu-like symptoms, the headache, the fever, the nausea, the vomiting, diarrhea, coughing, sneezing, eggs and pains, those kind of symptoms. That, that's just toxins in your body. They're not going out of your body fast enough. The cells dump them out, but they can't go out the body. That's why it's important to have a bowel movement every day. It's why it's important to support all of the organs of elimination, which I'm getting to in just a few seconds. Yes? Yeah, John, I did a 64-day uh, juice fast, and then I did a 45-day juice fast uh, a couple years later, and I didn't have any unusual bowel movements, and I didn't have a cleansing reaction, and I'm still wondering why. Well, if you're eating good, you shouldn't have much to come out of you. I just did a 40-day one here in the last month or so. I usually do, like I said, I usually do one a year just to remind myself how much fun it is. <laughs> and, and I didn't have anything come out of me. So once you go on a long one and get all cleaned out, then you really shouldn't have anything else come back unless you're not eating well. Well, even on the first one, it was only, um, I think, within six months of trying a raw food diet. So I'm sure, you know, there's still a lot of old junk in there. And um, I just really wanted to have that uh, cleansing thing and, and find surprises in the toilet that nothing happened. <laughs> and, and, and no cleansing reaction. Didn't have any food like No cold. That just means you don't have that many toxins in your body anymore. The fact that you went on that long one initially, you got rid of a lot of things. But during that initial long one, nothing happened either. Nothing happened. Well, you know, I've, I've only had two cleansing reactions in the 903 days I've done this. And it happened on my third juice feast. I was out of town. It was on day 19. I'll never forget it. And it was a very minor cleansing reaction. I just felt a little nauseous for a few moments. And then I had a huge movement. I had, tw I had 24 ounces of stuff come out of me. Five minutes later, I felt the same sensation and had exactly 24 more ounces. How do I know? Because I took my scale with me. Oh, oh my God. Kept it. Oh, it uh, and, and what came out of me during those times, I, I, I wish I was at home when I had this happen because I would have poured that into another bucket. And I would have counted how many things I saw come out of me. I had about 80 diverticulous. <laughs> uh, I had about 80 diverticulas come out of me. A diverticula is those little herniated blowouts that we get because we're eating food that doesn't have any fiber. And that's what causes diverticulitis, diverticulosis. And the medical experts say everybody over 50 or 40 or whatever it is nowadays has this in them. I had about 80. I, I estimated how many I saw come out of me in those, just those two movements alone. I had about 80 of them. I'm still not sure what that is. What is it? Well, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a herniated blowout on the side of the cold wall. Imagine putting too much air in a tire and it blows a bubble out to the side. Okay. So but what, then what comes what out? Comes so, so what, comes what came out was the fecal matter that went into that bubble. Uh, so, so it's sort of like formed like a little it, it was like a, It was like a piece of a puzzle coming out of me. That's why I knew what it was. Because I saw pictures of what it, it looks like on the diagram. You got the colon, you got the little, like, like this is the, this is my colon. You got a little blowout off to the side of the wall. Well, that little thing that was inside there was old fecal matter. 
And when I, uh, so it was like, I, I knew what it was, it was like a, a, a piece of the puzzle coming out of me. And what I found for myself is as long as I adhere to 100% raw food, after I would do a, a juice feast, I wouldn't gain any weight. But then when I ate cooked food, it plugged me up and I started gaining weight. And that prompted me to do an experiment I did about 14 or so years ago. I had a, I had a theory. I thought I knew what was going on and, and, and I did a 30-day experiment which confirmed my theory. I, 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 I figured out that the cooked food was going back and filling out the places that I had emptied. And, and for 30 days, I took a step back for me at that time because I was about 99% raw. I said, well, let me see what happens if I'm 80% raw. And I'm not guessing here. I'm, I'm going through the calculations. I know it's right at 80%. I'm only eating one cooked meal a day, and it's something pretty innocent. I gained 20 pounds, or 17 pounds, in the first 20 days. Didn't gain any weight from day 21 to day 30. So what I thought would happen exactly happened. I filled my colon back up to where it was before I'd emptied it. And I know that's what happened because I, I lost those 17 pounds in, in, a, in no time flat. And, but this time when it came out, it wasn't old and hard. It was relatively fresh. But I knew what it was. It filled up those, those little pockets. So do you gain weight when you go back to cook food? It depends on the condition of your body. Now, because I'm getting real close to finishing my book, I conducted another experiment. I had to do it because... I had another belief that my system was healthy now and that that wouldn't happen again. So I did another 30-day experiment this year. You're the first one to hear about it. I tried eating cooked food again. I didn't gain any weight. You didn't get sick? So once you get clean, you're saying Once you're, one, not so much clean, no, it's not being clean, it's, it's being repaired. My, da my, my, my colon was still compromised. It was damaged. If we could take our colons out of our body and set it side by side to what a, a healthy colon is supposed to look like, it wouldn't even look like the same organ. It'd be twisted and bent out of shape. It doesn't even resemble what it's supposed to look like. It's not like, take, it's not like you took a, a carburetor out of an old car and it still looks like the new carburetor. So we damage our system and it takes a while for them to go back to where they need to be. Um, this was a big motivator for me in the beginning to not eat cooked food. Because every time I ate it, it plugged me up. But now I know that it doesn't always happen to everybody. It all depends on the type of damage you sustained. So this whole you ate the cooked food thing, yeah. how did that go? Like, how are you now? Like, are oh, you no. cravings? No, not at all. Not at all. It's, um, it was something I didn't want to do, but I knew I had to. As a scientist, I can't, I can't tell people what I've done to myself and, then, and, and not have it apply anymore. Is that a cooked vegan? Oh yeah, yeah. I did my own flesh. Yes, yes. Yes. Good question. Um, she wanted to know if you can do a juice feast when you're pregnant or breastfeeding. I'm pregnant and breastfeeding my 18 months old. The concern most women have with breastfeeding is will I, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, will my toxins go into the breast milk? Yes. But are you better off than the person eating McDonald's? Of course. Um, I, I've had this question asked before to me, and you could always do a test. Your baby's going to, you know, if your, your baby has a cleansing reaction, and it, you know what's happening. But it shouldn't take you long to be clean. Uh, Dr. Cousins did a, an interesting study at his place because he uh, was concerned with the very same issue, is how do we avoid passing these toxins down all through the breast milk? And he put a bunch of, uh, he put some women uh, on a juice feast with the NCD. And then one week later, what they, used to, they had somewhere between 14 and 15 toxins in, in their breast, brain, and their liver. And in one week, they had, uh, they had gone down to zero and two. So the NCD is really good at pulling toxins out of the body. It has a honeycomb-shaped structure to it, so it, it traps toxins. What's NCD? Natural cellular defense. Oh, oh, okay. NCD. Okay, so number eight, we want to do a, a, a prognosis for a, a self-diagnosis. And what that means is we want to massage all around our body, especially on our colon, to see what condition it's in. When you push on your body and it hurts, what does that tell you? you got toxins in that part of your body. It's really simple. 
How many people have had their foot, their foot massage recently? Most people, once they get past 25, 30, can't have their feet massaged because the toxins settle on our feet first and they're very sensitive. So what we can do when we're on a juice feast is we can massage on our colon, go up and down the colon. It starts here, goes around and over and down. Massage all around the colon. And if you find any tender areas, that means that's an area you might want to focus on a little bit more. In fact, the days I would spend a half hour to an hour massaging on my colon were always days that were worth the time because I always saw more stuff come out of me. And I'd just be watching TV or reading or listening to music or something. I'd lay on the floor. And you know how you, you do abdominal crunches? You get on your back and you bend your knees up. Well, when you drop your knees to your side, which is a real good stretch for the lower back, that exposes this area a lot easier. And you can get in there and dig in there and, and try to move things loose. So we talked about that before, about maybe that's something you could have done um, to, if, if, if nothing's coming out. It, when I'm working with someone and they don't see anything really amazing, it's the first time they've done it, and it's obvious you know they've got something in them, uh, that's usually when I suggest to them that they might try the psyllium bentonite shakes, which we'll talk about in just a moment, um, and, then the, uh, and then also some colonics. I, I remember working with a, a lady about five years ago, and she wasn't seeing anything come out, Marcy. And she started doing three colonics a week, and the colon therapist was going, you won't believe, you just won't believe what's coming out of you. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, we can do that everywhere on our body. If you have any tender areas, that's a good idea to go ahead and massage on that area. Number nine are the cleansing reactions we already briefly talked about. And we want to avoid the cleansing reactions. We want to support all of our organs of elimination. The main organ of elimination is our back. We want to make sure we have movements every day. A lot of ways to do that. We can take herbs. We can do enemas. We can do colonics. Whatever you feel comfortable doing. But we have to understand that this is somewhat of a slippery slope because we can become dependent on these things. They're habit forming. When we normally have a bowel movement, it's like someone's knocking on the door. You start doing animals and herbs, it's like someone's pounding on the door. Well, when you go back to knocking, you don't respond. So you have to understand that and use, use, those, use all of these different protocols with a little discretion. In the beginning, it's real important. So in the beginning, I like to do a lot of those and then as we know, we're getting cleaner back off of those so we can come off of them. A lot of people I coach have had histories of constipation, a history of constipation. And the last thing we want to do is to keep having them do something to make them go, which is what they've been doing. We want to get off of that. Um, it just depends on what you're experiencing. I, I, not, not, I only like to do it at the beginning. And one of my favorite herbs to get the bowels moved is Cascara Sobrata. When I first, when I do this, and when I, back when I needed to do it, I would take 15, 18 of those a day. Every three hours I was taking three of them. I, I pushed myself to see what I could do. I even did 25 in one day to see how it affected. And the concept here is if we can have two, three, four movements a day instead of one or two, we might see the same results in 30 days. That might take 90 days. So it behooves us to, to help the system out as much as we can with an understanding that we might get ourselves in trouble if we make our body depend on this too much. In addition to the colon, we can support our lymph system. We can do skin brushing, very beneficial. We can uh, do deep diaphragmical breathing, which is something everyone really should know how to do. Because most of us are what we call shallow breathers. Most of us, if I was to ask everybody to take a big deep breath, people's chest would puff up. That's not using your diaphragm. Your diaphragm is an elastic muscle that runs underneath the rib cage. And when you breathe in, using your diaphragm, it sucks down and your belly bulges out. So if, if, you're, if, if, if you're taking a normal breath, most people bring in, take in one pint of air at a time. But if I said, wait a minute, let's take a bigger breath, let's take a bigger breath as you can, turns out you can breathe in three more pints of air. Now when you breathe those three out plus the, the first one you, you breathe in, you got to not stop there because there's three more pints of air inside of us. And this is the hardest part about breathing because we, it's almost like you feel like you're drowning because you, you're so used to breathing in so, so soon. But you got to really make an effort. 
And I think it's easier to go out and run a 100 yard dash than it is to breathe those last three pints of air out of you. Because again, you have that knee jerk reflex of, I gotta get some air. But you really wanna focus and squeeze everything out of you. And then when you breathe in, you wanna make sure that you fill up the bottom part of your abdomen first. If you're not sure how to do this, lay on your back, put one hand here, <clears throat> one hand here, one out here. And then practice taking deep, big deep breaths. And when you breathe in, this hand should go up first, and then this hand should go up. When you exhale, the hand on the chest goes down, and then down here. And then after you do that for a while, you can put some telephone books or something down here, and then just practice pushing the telephone books out. <laughs> and if we can get those last three pints of air out of us, and then we take a big deep breath, we're putting in seven pints of air now in our body. And we can also incorporate visualization at this time. I believe in using every thing at our disposal when we're healing. And the mind is extremely powerful. Quantum physicists understand this concept now. Uh, if you've studied people like Bruce Lipton, they're saying that our thoughts are a thousand times more powerful than drugs. And, and Bruce Lipton really helped me understand why doctors are so clueless. Because he, he taught doctors in, in school. And he said that most of our diseases are due to inappropriate signals. No wonder doctors don't get it. Before they even know anything, the first thing they're taught is diseases are inappropriate signals. No, they're part of our feedback system. Nothing inappropriate about pain. We need to know if we're doing something wrong. So that's why doctors just don't get it. Right off the bat, they're taught to negate the law of cause and effect because it's just an inappropriate signal. We gotta correct the signal. And that's what the drugs are doing. That allows them to justify what they're doing. They think it's okay to inter interrupt the signal. But the body knows what it's doing. We don't want to interrupt that process. So, um, so breathing diaphragmically is very, very important. We can use our mind. We can use visualization at the same time. So as you're breathing in, imagine you've got little bitty soldiers running inside your body. And have them go down to where you know a tumor is or some problem and have them work on it. So there's a Hatha Yoga breathing sequence of one, four, two. Where you breathe in for a count of one, you hold it for a count of four, you exhale for a count of two. So you take a big deep breath after you exhale everything out. Count how long it takes. If it takes 10 seconds, that means you've got to hold it for 40 seconds. You might not be able to do that, so you've got to modify this a little bit. So uh, an easy way to remember this is when you're breathing in, you bring, you, 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 you bring those guys in quickly, but then you leave them in there for four times as long as it took to get them in there so they gather as much bad stuff as they can and repair as much stuff as they can. And when you breathe out, you breathe out twice as long as it took to get them in to make sure they all leave and they get out of here. So it's real important we support the limb system. Again, the skin brushing, very simple to do. If you don't have a skin brush, it's a, it, it's a good investment. When people do the skin brushing, and, and you have a bowel movement while you're on the juice feast, you'll see the lymph fluids coming through. You can tell the difference uh, in the consistency of what's coming out. Is that good? Yes. The trampoline. All, all type of exercise uh, will help uh, move the lymph fluids. We've got about almost four times as, many lymph, as much lymph fluid as we do blood in our body. Every cell in our body is surrounded by lymph fluid. So the cells empty out their waste matter into the lymph fluid. The lymph fluid goes to the colon. And hopefully the colon is not like a vacuum cleaner bag that's full. It can absorb this stuff. Uh, so exercise will move the lymph fluids. Deep breathing will move the lymph fluids. Jumping on a trampoline is very, very, very good for moving the lymph fluids. Perhaps maybe one of the best, best ways. So thanks for bringing that up. Uh, but the basic walking is also very good. So you want to do something. You want to be active, which I explained down the road here, uh, if you have the energy. And once again, if you're doing everything right, you're still having a cleansing reaction, that tells me your liver can't handle the toxic load. And if you've got a condition like cancer, there's a good chance that your liver is going to be compromised and will not be able to handle the load, and you will have to definitely do something to support your liver. Um, uh, yes? How do you support your kidneys? Pardon me? When do you need to support you? Well, that, that's when the chalka pieta comes into play. And I'm glad you brought that up because if you have kidney problems, you might not be able to do the juice feast. That's why I've got the lemonade feast on there also. The, the, the kidneys still have to process juices. So if your kidneys are compromised, they may not handle the volume of juices that we're drinking. 
And the only thing that will cleanse kidneys is distilled water. So you can use distilled water when you make this lemonade drink. And if you are having problems, let's say you do a juice feast and you're not losing any weight and you're not urinating like you should. That means your kidneys can't handle the load. That's when you need to back off a little bit and be flexible and say, well, let me try this lemonade drink for a while. Might need to do it for a week or two or three. You're not going to get nearer the nutrition you would normally be getting. But that's when you go to those superfoods. If you're doing the lemonade drink, you're not getting everything else you're getting. So you need to supplement with some superfoods to get the minerals. And you will probably also have to supplement the protein. You might need to take some hemp protein powder because there's not a lot of protein in these uh, superfood supplements. But there is a lot of protein in hemp protein powder. So when I'm coaching people in the beginning, when I first started teaching people this a long time ago, they didn't have the better machines that made the better juice. So most of my students who had to work did the lemonade drink while they were at work. And if half of your juices are coming from that lemonade, you're not going to be getting near the nutrition you could be getting. And you should really consider doing a few extra supplements like the superfoods and the hemp protein powder. But we don't need as much protein as we think. Not near as much as we've been led to believe. Now, uh, at this time, let me review the herbs that we, we want to take. Uh, the Cascara Sagrada is my preference to make the, the, herb, the bowels move, but you do whatever you like. Oxy powder, uh, Dr. Ed Group, many of you may know Ed Group here in town. He came up with this, uh, with this uh, uh, protocol, this, uh, this supplement. Uh, it, it works on a different principle, and it's uh, much better for people who don't want their system to become dependent on something that's a stimulant in any way. Um, but, uh, but, but we can also do things like the psyllium bentonite shakes. Uh, the psyllium bentonite shake is, um, is something I usually save for maybe in the second month or so. I'm not really fond of using that early on because the body's going to be cleansing out all by itself without doing anything else. But once we get to a certain point and we know we're really, really clean, then we can try to speed up the process and do the psyllium bentonite shakes. The psyllium is just a bulking agent. It absorbs 10 to 15 times its own weight. The, volcanic, uh, the bentonite clay is a volcanic acid. It absorbs 180 times its own weight. So when we mix those two together, it forms like a magnetic sponge. You can actually pull the stuff out feet at a time. And if I'm coaching someone and they don't see things happening, after a while, I say, well, let's test it out. Let's try some psyllium bentonite clay and see if maybe that doesn't pull something out. Is there a recipe for that? Uh, it's a teaspoon of each. A teaspoon of psyllium, a teaspoon of bentonite clay, unless you use the liquid bentonite clay, in that case you use a tablespoon. And you add eight ounces of water, shake it, drink it quickly. Dr. Richard Anderson has a book called Cleanse and Purify, the, his, Cleanse and Purify Thyself, and that's a big part of his protocol. Uh, V.E. Irons used this, Dr. Bernard Jensen used it. You can go to tissue cleansing through bowel management and, um, and see his protocol for that. Uh, the reason why I like to leave it, or save it, for later on is because it has its limitations. Once we build up to five shakes a day, we can only do it for about five days. So it only makes sense to me is to do that at the opportune time. Let's not do it in the beginning because we really won't see the benefits like we could later on. Um, now, breaking the fast. Most important rule, they, they say that any fool can fast. It takes a wise person to break the fast the right way. And I'm amazed at how many people I've coached and they weren't able to do it the right way. And it's mainly because someone walked in the room with a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Smell gets us in trouble, doesn't it? Um, I'm very adamant about how to break the juice feast. I spent a lot of time detailing everything I did to figure out what to do. And I'm convinced that prunes are really the only way to go. What? Prunes. prunes. <laughs> Get some prunes, soak them overnight. Eat those first things in the morning for the first meal. And that's going to blast through you like you won't believe. <laughs> if you're clean. So there's a prune test here. If you don't see what I call prune diarrhea, within an hour, you need to get back on that horse and keep riding. Now, there's a rule of thumb when it comes to, to breaking the fast. And it's usually for every four days you go, you take one day to break it. But once you get up to... 24 days or so, you don't have to keep using that rule. If you go 100 days, you don't have to take 25 days to break it. <laughs> but you might need 9 or 10, maybe even 6. We don't know. Uh, 6 days will break almost any fast. 
but we don't know. Nothing's etched in stone when it comes to breaking the fast. Every, every, whatever you do depends on what you did and how it's going through you. Again, if you do prunes on an empty stomach first thing in the morning, in an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, the floodgates open up and you're going to have a dozen movements if you're clean. If you're not clean, that won't happen. How many prunes? I take eight ounces of prunes and I soak them in 16 ounces of water. That's quite a few prunes. How many? It depends on how big they are. I just weigh everything. I don't go by numbers because that doesn't tell me what my analytical mind wants. I want specifics. 15 prunes or 10 prunes doesn't tell me anything, so I can't tell you how many it would be. So when you go to the store, just weigh them. And eight ounces is a lot of prunes. If, when you haven't eaten for three months, eight ounces of prunes, you're going to be stuffed. Most women I coach can barely eat four ounces. So what I tell the female students is take six ounces, double, put it in 12 ounces of water, and try to eat at least two-thirds of that, which would have been four ounces had you started with. But if you can do the other remaining amount, by all means do so. And again, what, what that does is it jump starts our system. And it's real important, once we start breaking the feast, we don't use anything else to make the bowels move. If you eat the prunes and you don't have a bowel movement, don't take cascara sagrada. Don't, don't, don't take anything to make the bowels move once you're breaking the fast. On juicefeasting.com, the last time I checked, David says if you, if you don't have a bowel movement after you eat the prunes, take some cascara sagrada. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We don't want to do anything. This is the time we want to get off everything and get the system to start working on its own. And if we haven't done anything for this long period of time and we eat these prunes, it should jumpstart the system and get it working on its own. So what do you do the rest of the day? Okay, I'm just getting ready to tell you that. So that's the first <laughs> minute, the prunes. Now that's 635 calories if you can eat eight of them. That would represent almost three pints of juice. And if you need eight pints, you know you still need to drink five pints of juice. If you're only consuming four ounces of prunes in their dry weight, and, and, and they're going to gain weight when they, they absorb the water, they're going to gain a couple ounces, um, then that's only 300 calories, and that's maybe a pint and a half. So you still, this is why breaking the fast is so difficult. We're still juicing. It's the hardest part of the protocol. Are you blending those or eating them whole? No, I'm not blending. I'm eating them whole. And believe me, you're going to want to enjoy the chewing of it. It's, it's, it's quite a treat. And when those prunes come out of you, you're going to go, hey, I had my first sweet bowel movement. It will come out sweet if there's nothing else in there. Now, when you first eat the prunes, if you're still plugged up, if there's still anything in there, this might get rid of it. Another reason why we do the prunes. Um, and, and again, I've documented everything I've done. I know. I've done this too many times. I've done this, I've done this like 133 times. And I've done it pretty much the same way every time at, at, towards the end. I see the same thing like clockwork. I can almost set my clock to it saying, okay, it's been an hour. I should be having something. And, then, and so what this means is you sure don't want to go to work or be on the road when this happens. <laughs> you want to plan this. <laughs> Definitely a day you, you take off from work. Yes. Well, I would get back on the horse. That's what I've done in the past. Well, if you don't want to. <laughs> then you go ahead and say, I'll just do it later, and you, you continue onward. But the important thing is, while we're breaking the fast, you don't want to keep eating if things aren't coming out. You just don't want to do that. So day one, we're only eating one meal. So let's, I'm going to give you several examples on how to break the fast so you can see how this works. Let's say, in this first example, we went 24 days. Divide by four, it's, we're going to take six days to break it. In this period of time, we're going to introduce three food groups. Laxative fruits, juicy fruits, and a salad. So now we, we're taking six days to break it, three food groups. Every two days, we get to add another food group. The first two days, we're only eating one meal. First day, ideally prunes. But if you love persimmons and you're thinking, God, I didn't get to eat any of these persimmons all season long, I'm going to use persimmons to break my fast, we'll go ahead and do it. I did this time. It's the first time I've ever done anything but prunes this time because I wanted to eat those persimmons. <laughs> and they work just fine. Uh, so the first day, only one meal. Normally what happens, if you don't see the prune diarrhea immediately, which turns to prune porridge in about two hours, <laughs> it gets thicker and thicker, and you can finally see it. In about two to three hours, you'll finally see all the prunes come out of you, and it will come out totally different than all the other stuff did. 
But you know it was a prune is because if you look at it, you can see the prune, the little specks of fiber in the, in the toilet. Mostly water, but just a little bit of the fiber. And then at the very end, you'll see a much more solid movement because one of the jobs the colon has is to recycle water. So the longer food is in your system, the more drier it becomes. That's why if you have a bowel movement and it's formed, you're eating food that takes too long to go from point A to point B. And too much water has been sucked out of it. A healthy bowel movement should not be formed. It should be soft and moist, and when you flush the toilet, it should break up. If your movements are coming out like hot dogs and sausages, you're constipated. Mildly, at least, and maybe severely. So, with the prunes, um, that's what happens when you're clean. And then for me, on a couple occasions, that didn't happen, and then, then they came out about eight hours later. And then I got back on to the juice feast, and sure enough, I had more, some more stuff in there that had to come out of me. Yes? Is there any special philosophy on whether that first meal should be breakfast, lunch, dinner? Yes, I think the morning is the best time to do it. Um, this was also the last one I just did, the last 40 day juice fast I just did. It was the first time that I didn't use prunes in a long time. I used persimmons and it's the first time I did it as an evening meal. I've always done it in the morning, always. And as far as a philosophy, which would be better? It only makes sense, really. It would be better probably in the evening. Because once you start eating, you want to eat again. This is what makes breaking the fast so hard. You can't resume what you were doing. You've got to respect the fact that you've given your body a vacation and it can't handle three meals and two squares a day. You can't do that. We have to respect our body's limitations and what we put it through. So um, I still think it's best in the morning no matter what. It may be more difficult because you were going to want to keep eating throughout the day. But if you eat it in the morning, you have a better chance to test what it's doing and then make sure that it comes out by the next morning at least. That way you know you can eat again. Because if it doesn't come out the next day, you've got to think, oh my gosh, why didn't those come out of me? They should have come out easily. And if they haven't, you've got to realize you still have some unfinished work to do. So day one, one meal. Day two, one meal. Provided day one went okay. Again, nothing's etched in stone. We take it one day at a time and we make sure that we're flexible in our approach and we do what we know is right for our body. The next day, it's not so important that we use prunes again. So you can try any juicy fruit or laxative fruit you like. It really doesn't matter. Um, and then the next two days is when we add one more meal to the, to the regimen. And this time we can have two meals of juicy fruits. And again, we've got to go back to the juices because we're not going to get enough calories. And again, we're monitoring everything that's happening. And you're going to be able to go, wow, that was the watermelon that came out of me. Oh, those are the pears. I can tell. I can tell the difference. And then the last two days when we start eating a salad, you're really going to be able to tell the difference between what salad looks like when it comes out as opposed to fruit. Big difference. Huge difference. So the first two days, only one meal. The next two days, two meals. Then the last two days, we get to add the third meal, the salad. So I have two meals of juicy fruit and then have a salad. And keep the salad simple, no more than maybe three leafy greens. Cauliflower, broccoli, we really can't digest those foods raw. We can't break down the cellulose in those foods. So you're much better off sticking with the leafy greens. And even on the last two days, when we're eating three meals, there's a good chance you're not getting enough calories, so you still need to juice. You still need to juice. This is also a perfect time to, to test our system, to see what foods might be giving us trouble. If you've always thought bananas gave you a problem, well, eat bananas, nothing but bananas for two or three days and see what happens. You can test out certain foods for allergies or whatever. Then the next two rules have to do with other essential needs that we have. As far as fresh air and sunshine, we talked about sunshine earlier, how important vitamin D is. Also, as far as exercise goes, listen to your body. If you don't have any energy and you feel weak, by all means, rest. The body heals when it's resting. When I'm coaching people who are really, really sick, sometimes they, instead of not needing as much sleep, which is what happens with most people, it's just the opposite. They need to sleep 16 hours a day. So listen to your body. If you have energy, by all means, get out there and move. 
But if you don't, if you feel like you need extra rest, take the time to rest. And finally, the last three rules deal with putting our body back in order once we cleanse it all, cleanse it all out. We can restore the friendly bacteria if we feel we need to. I'm not as convinced we need to do this anymore unless you've had issues with a bunch of antibiotics where you know you've compromised your bacteria. Otherwise, the bacteria should replenish itself on its own. And then we can also do a parasite cleanse at this time. The parasites can hide inside the fecal matter, so it's best to wait towards the end of the protocol or once we know we're clean. You can actually start a parasite cleanse in the second month if you know you're going to go this, do this for a while and you know you've gotten rid of their hiding places. And one more thing we can do is we can also shrink the colon. We can take an astringent herb called white oak bark, mix it, mix it in with ginger root, take that for a few days, uh, for 10 days, and that will actually shrink the colon. When I did this the first time and only time, I only done it once, I could hear and feel my intestines shrinking and gurgling. You can take white oak, if you have a loose tooth, you can take white oak bark, it'll tighten the gums around your tooth. Why do you want to shrink the colon? Because the colon can stretch. It's only supposed to be about two, two and a half inches in diameter, but we've seen autopsies of people with 10 inch colons. And why is that important? Well, the way our muscles work, we have filaments that overlap. And when a muscle contracts, it pulls like this. When we pull a muscle, the filaments aren't overlapping anymore and there's no contraction. A lot of people are constipated because their colon's stretched out so far, there's no peristaltic wave anymore. And the only way they can have a bowel movement which I always get a kick out of people who I look at them, I can tell they've got a lot of stuff in there and they say, oh, I have four or five meals a day. And that's because they're eating four or five times a day and every, every time they put food in here, it's pushing it down. And that's why they have a movement. It's not because there's a muscle action down there, it's just forcing things down. So to make sure we have good peristalsis, we want to shrink our colon. Yes? So, uh, the parasite, you said that to do it the second you could do it as early, as, as soon as you know you've gotten rid of their hiding places. How long we go depends on each person and what conditions they have. For me, when I first did this, I just said I want to get everything out of me and it took 90 days. But in your particular case, if you have arthritis, you, you might have to keep your colon empty so that it aggressively pulls things into it faster. You'll still see the same results by changing your diet, but not as aggressively and not as quickly. John, yes? How um, would this protocol compare to somebody who went exclusively onto a series of colonics? When we only do colonics and we don't change what puts, we go in here, it's just a, a vicious cycle. Same thing with herbs. If I wanted to be a millionaire, I could have been a millionaire a long time ago, because I know a lot about how this works. I'd be selling people pills to take, and I wouldn't tell them what to eat. If they change their diet, it shouldn't matter. And, and I like to think of my protocol as a reverse colonic. The colonic can only go so far up. We don't want to just clean the colon, we want to clean the small intestines too. And there's a lot of gunk in there too. So by running all this enzyme-rich, nutrient-rich juice through our body, it flushes and cleanses everything out. If you look at the small intestines, it's 22 feet long, but they say if we stretch it out, it would cover the area of, of a, the surface area of a tennis court. Now imagine if that, that tennis court had a little thin layer of dust on it or dirt and you swept it up in the pile, how big would that pile be? What if that pile, what if it was pretty thick? It could, there could be a lot of stuff in there. So the colonic will never go up as far as the small intestines to cleanse that out also. Plus it won't give us all the other things we need. It won't, it won't reset our survival mechanism. It won't bump up our biophotons. It, it won't give us that new reference that's going to help us make the changes we need to make. Now one thing I didn't even get into is, is the biophoton aspect of this. If there is one reason why we want to eat this kind of food, it has to do with the fact that when we cook our food, we destroy the biophotons. Does anyone know what a biophoton is? It's a measure of sunlight energy. It's sunlight energy, exactly. The sunlight that brings our planet to life is actually stored in the nucleus of our cells. Bio is life, photon is light. Dr. Pop has a meter and can measure biophotons in all living systems that have uh, a nucleus, which are eukaryotic cells like fungus and plants and animals. And he found the sicker you are, the less of these biophotons you have. And the more of these biophotons you have, the more vibrant you are. And he found that when we're born, we got about 43,000 biophotons. 
A junk food eater may only have 1,000. An organic vegan, maybe 23,000. A raw organic vegan is around 83,000. You jump on a juice feast, you're up to 114,000. So if, if we're supposed to be in the 80s and we're down in the teens, we've got maybe 10, 20% of what we need to have. Now why is that important? Every cell uses biophotons to communicate to everything else. I like to think of biophotons as little miniature cell phones inside of our cells. And I use that analogy because imagine what would happen if your cell phone reception was only 10% or 20%. You wouldn't even know you're on the grid, but you are. So what the biophotons do is they help us understand that we're all one. And that's why I'm so adamant about my mission because I believe that if we had one law on this planet and only one law, that everybody had to have a minimal biophoton level, I believe war, crime, violence, disease would disappear. I'm convinced. Why? Because we would know we're all one. We'd know we're all in the same hole together and we wouldn't want anyone to suffer because we would suffer too. Intellectually, I've always been able to wrap my brain around this concept. Even, even before I knew anything about this, when I was 19 years old, I, I always wanted other people to be happy. And it reminds me of a, a bizarre story. When I was driving down a neighborhood one time and I saw uh, a couple walking and the woman was about five or ten feet behind the, the gentleman. And I, and I thought to myself, well, they must have been in a fight. They weren't Asian, so I know that you know, Asians like to, might do that too. But, but I thought to myself, you know, they, they must not be getting along. So I went by them. I acted like a fool. I went by them. Just I acted crazy to get them to start talking. And I looked in my mirror. Sure enough, they started talking again. But, but I'm, I'm smart enough to realize that my happiness depends on other people's happiness. How can I be happy if other people are suffering? But you don't have to, but, but I realize not everybody can intellectualize it about this. And you don't need to intellectualize it if you have the biophotons. You would sense it, you would feel it. It's like a sixth sense. You know, history refers to the fall of mankind. The fall of mankind happened when we started cooking our foods and we destroyed our biophotons. That's what made us feel separate. Many people even think God is separate. There is no separateness to anything. We're all interconnected. Even on a subatomic level right now, we're exchanging atoms with everything around us. We're not separate. So the biophotons helps us understand that. And at that level, that's not intellectual, it's a feeling. It's like a sixth sense. Scientists try to explain how birds can fly, hundreds of thousands of them, they know where to go and where to end up. And fish can swim and they make designs to, to, to ward off their predators. How are they able to do all of that? They know they're communicating somehow, but it's not audio and visual. It's the biophotons. In fact, this even ties into an experiment Albert Einstein did with two other gentlemen. They called the EPR paradox, where they proved that faster than light communication exists. And this has been duplicated numerous times since Einstein's day. You can take a subatomic particle, and we know that when we observe a particle, we influence it. That's what quantum physics are, are, are saying now. We live in a world that responds to our thoughts. The Celestine Prophecy tried to help us understand that concept. And, uh, and, and, and we know that when we measure a particle, it changes the spin. So, what, so some of the latter research they did is they took a subatomic particle, they separated it, and put one on the east coast and one on the west coast, and they measured one of the particles, and the other particle changed instantaneously. There was no time lapse whatsoever. How can that happen? It's communicating using biophotons. Scientists now say that at the time of the Big Bang, everything that is in the universe without any space could fit in something the size of a green pea. They used to say it was at the tip of a needle, but this was just last year. The scientists are saying, we traced it back mathematically. Everything could fit inside, the, inside of something the size of a green pea. Well, how hard would it be for something on top of a green pea to communicate to something on the bottom of the green pea? Not a piece of cake, but spread that out the universe, guess what? It still exists. Particles on one side of the universe can still communicate to the other side. There is no separate, there is no distance. It's almost like space is an illusion. But, but this is what the biophotons is all about. Is when you get, when you, when you do a long juice feast, you're going to bump up your biophotons and when you finally feel connected to everything around you, it's going to be the most exciting experience of your entire life. You just have no idea. When it happened to me, I remember I was on that 9 and 8 juice feast when it happened to me. Tears started pouring out of my eyes uncontrollably for about 15 minutes. And I wasn't sad. I, was, I felt so much reverence 
for the first time in my life because I felt like I was, I, I felt the connection. I never felt it before. So a lot of us don't know what we're missing. That's what the Jesus Feast will do. It will give you the experience of the consequences. It will allow you to see what you're missing so now you can evaluate and reevaluate everything you've been doing and then make better choices. Yes? Any problem with one kidney? Well, the beauty about how our body works is most of our organ systems can do many times what they need to do. And if you lose a kidney, guess what happens to the other kidney? It doubles in size. So good question. I know y'all asked a bunch of questions earlier. I got the five minute sign a second ago. Any questions I didn't address? Well, thank you for all this valuable, wonderful information and the big motivation. What's the trick for staying warm in the cold weather when you're juice feasting? Add cayenne to your juices? Yes, add cayenne to your juices. You can even sprinkle it inside your shoes. Yeah, you can. You can. Yes. Cayenne pepper. You'll warm your feet up. Yes. One capsule each, twice a day for for ten days. Three times a day for ten days. Three to three times a day. Three, three, one capsule of each, three times a day for ten days. Of the white oak bark and ginger root. What is the name of your book? That's why it's not done yet. I can't oh. find a title. Oh, oh my God! I Junk know. in the trunk. Junk in the trunk. There you go. <laughs> hey, <fair enough. laughs> I like it. Really? Seriously? That's not a bad title. Uh, I, I originally got into this because I was writing a book on weight loss. I want my message to appeal to everybody. Everyone. In fact, in my book, I don't even use the word spirituality because I don't want it to offend people who might be an atheist or agnostic. I want this appeal to the Muslims and the Christians and the atheists and agnostics. If you've got an enemy, by gosh, you want them to learn this so they're no longer an enemy. So you can feel connected and you won't have any, any problems with them anymore. Also there you go. Yeah, those are clever. I'm very receptive to any ideas. Um, my email should be on those on the, on the information. I've got some business cards I have here also I can give you. Um, you can find me online. My website's under construction still. I appreciate all feedback from everybody. Yes? I'm going to try to upload this on video uh, on YouTube as soon as I can, yes. Yes. Um, if y'all want to leave me your email addresses, I'll put a sheet of paper up here. If you want to, uh, if you want to leave your email to be notified uh, for the video or anything like that, I'll be glad to contact y'all. And you can always just do a search on me on the internet. And you'll find me somehow. And and uh, thanks again for giving me a chance to share my message. Enjoy. It. I'll give you one. I'll put my business cards up here on the counter, on the table, right here real quick. It won't last long, maybe we'll be breaking this down in any second. <laughs> Who's this? Oh, okay. Is that two or one? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for coming, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 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 B I O B A O T O N. Bio O T O N. B I O T H O T O N. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Very good, thank you. And, uh, depends on what medication you're on. Some, you know, uh, I don't ever like to, um, you know, when it comes to medication, you gotta know what you're on. Some medication you can pretty much cold trick you right away. 
How are we doing time wise? She said that it's going to be. Uh, Okay. Oh, we got plenty of pictures of that one. There are 40 scientific organizations studying this. Most of them, almost all of them are German. Uh, uh, in fact, the, the best books out there haven't even translated to English yet. Uh, got Gabriel Cousins talks about bio photons in his book called uh, Conspiracy Nutrition. Uh, if you do a Google search with Bob Photon and Gabriel Cousins, you'll hear the 43,000, the 1,000, the 23,000, the 83,000, the 114,000. That's exactly, I'm quoting, I'm quoting, quoting, quoting Cousins. Okay. Yeah, I I it came out in 2008. Size of the green tea. They say the green tea. Yeah, I'm trying to find as many people as I can. I'm trying to do the same thing I'm doing. Uh, you know, the market's coming in there. Everybody needs to come in there. It's slowed down the last few months, but it's good. Exactly. Otherwise, it's, it's, um, I used to always, I never got before, now I'm getting before. Only because it's the raw food that I've out there in the world. And then, and then Gabriel Cousins' book uh, on reverse uh, diabetes. Uh, there is a person I do. I met him there. I think it's all in California, New York, all over. An hour and fifty two. Oh,